Hi, I'm Clark Gregg, and I'm at home. And I suspect you're at home, too. A lot of us are at home, and so we're trying to find things to do to make the most out of this time that we have here. One of the things I did is I rescued an orphaned puppy. Her name is Lucy, and she is an orphan no more. One of the other things that I like to do while I'm here is I catch up on my reading, some of my favorite stories. And one of my favorite stories, as I'm sure it's one of your favorite stories, is a wonderful story that's been loved throughout the galaxy for tens of thousands of years. Of course, I'm talking about the witch and the Wookiee. So I was thinking maybe we could read that story together. So here it is, the witch and the Wookiee. It was once said that so powerful and all-encompassing was the will of the emperor that the eyes of his agents could see into every crevice and darkened corner throughout the known galaxy and no deed could ever pass unobserved. Yet observing is not the same as seeing, and the emperor's attention was forever drawn to matters of governance and the quelling of rebellions. Therefore, in many of those hidden places on the outer rim, seeds of indifference flourished. And those who had once lived under the empire's yoke had become disillusioned by the iron rule of imperial law and in their grievance seized the opportunity to carve their own path. So it was that a small band of pirates came to find themselves aboard a stolen ship with a huge haul of treasure in its hold. There was little honor among thieves and these pirates. A bald, leathery-skinned Weequay named Marath, a tentacle-faced Quarren named Kalab, and a human named Juliet had once been part of a much larger crew, but the lure of riches had proved too strong and the three conspirators had betrayed their fellow criminals to make off with the treasure. As a consequence, they found themselves hunted not only by their former allies, but also by the forces of the imperial governor from whom they had originally stolen the treasure and desperately in need of safe haven and a suitable hiding place in which to store their ill-gotten gains. Hounded at every turn by those who would have their revenge, the pirates fled from star system to star system until finally, in the orbit of the planet Jas, in the system of Hoth, they found momentary respite or respite. Seeing that it was only a matter of time before their enemies caught up with them, the pirates devised a plan. They would hide their newly acquired wealth where none but them could find it, for they had each become enamored with the promise of the riches in their hold, and none could bear the thought of any other laying hands upon the treasure. They would then scatter to the distant corners of wild space to lay low for a time, until their trail grew cold and their crimes were all but forgotten. Then, when the moment was right, the three of them would meet again to recover the treasure, which they would split equally amongst themselves, assuming that they had all still lived and managed to evade those who sought them out. So it was that Juliet, for she was the smartest and most devious of the three, and a former lieutenant in the military, settled on a small, uninhabited moon in the orbit of Jas as the location for their hiding place. Now, the moon of Jas Krill, it was whispered by those in the murky cantinas of the Outer Rim, was a foreboding place where nothing lived but the swamp creatures and the twisted trees that grew amidst the foul bogs and the steaming swamps. It was said that all who visited the moon disappeared, swallowed by the swamps themselves, so the moon was given a wide berth by any and all travelers who went to the region. Juliet reasoned, despite the trepidation of her companions, that such a place would prove the perfect spot to hide their treasure, for no one would think to search for it in such a grim and isolated location, and the rumors would do the work for them and dissuade others from seeking their fortune there. Thus, the three pirates made landfall, landfall on the small, unwelcoming moon. Now, pirates, by their very nature, are not fearful people. So, upon disembarking from their ship, perched on a low, rocky plateau above the forest canopy, they were not dismayed by the strange, murky quality of the light or the shifting sounds of things moving deep in the bubbling swamp water. As far as their eyes could see, the surface of the moon was wild and untamed, teeming with plants and animal life. There were no buildings, no suborbital platforms, no sign of anything at all, save for mile upon mile of swamp and marshland and towering trees twisted and spiky, their branches swaying as they whispered to one another in the cool breeze. They knew they had found the perfect place to stow their treasure, if only they could find a suitable cavern or hollow for it. 
The ship and its precious cargo, they agreed, would be safe for a short while, and the automated defense systems would ensure that anyone who did follow them would be in for a nasty shock. Thus the three pirates set out to explore the immediate area, each of them anxious to settle on a final, final hiding place before the darkness set in. The three of them searched for hours, trudging through the mud, but still no caverns or hollows presented themselves. Thus they were forced to delve ever deeper into the forbidding jungle, their boots stirring the swirling swamp water, while unseen creatures slithered around the boles of trees following through the undergrowth. The jungle proved difficult to navigate, and the pirates had a sense that even as they walked, the pathways through the trees were shifting and altering in their wake, branches twisting and nodding together to block their retreat. None of them gave voice to this fear, however, lest they incur the mockery of the others. So they continued, uneasily, ever deeper into the darkening jungle, each of them fearful of speaking out or attempting to return to the ship. Night soon fell. And as the last of the light bled away beneath the treetops, the creatures in the swamps began to stir, dragging their lizard-like bellies from the dirty pools and streams, sliding amongst the fallen leaves that had formed a slippery carpet on the forest floor. Shadows seemed to leer at them from amongst the trees, describing the monstrous things in the darkness, leaving them jittery and nervous as they crept on through the jungle. They searched now for a place of shelter as much as a hiding place for their treasure, for the route back to the ship was long lost behind them, and they knew that to stumble onward through the dark was to invite danger, for they might at any moment lose their footing in the boggy swamps, or worse, succumb to one of the terrible creatures they could hear snuffling through the undergrowth all around them. Their way was lit by nothing but a single torch and the weak glow of distant jazz, and as they forced their way on, shivering, even the beam of the torch began to waver, we must find shelter, said Morath, or all has been for naught, and we shall die out here lost in the swamps, and in time others will find our treasure. The others agreed, and compelled by the thought that they might lose that which they had sacrificed so much to gain, they pressed on, even as the torch flickered and died, and they were forced to navigate in near darkness, mindful of every step. Now the jungle seemed like a small dark place, closing in around them as they crept, and even the trees clawed at them with vicious branches, scratching at their arms as they stumbled blindly in the hope of salvation. All around them, the slithering sounds of the creatures grew ever louder, ever closer. It was then that Kalab spotted the soft glow of a light up ahead amongst the trees. At first the pirates could not tell if it was the nearby flicker of a firebug or the distant light of a pyre, so disoriented were they by the oppressive surroundings. Like moths to a beacon, they were drawn to that light, stumbling from the path they had been following through the press of branches and the frigid ankle-deep water until at last they came upon its source. There, deep in the forest, was a small clearing, and in that clearing was a house. The pirates looked to one another in sheer astonishment, for the moon was thought to be uninhabited, not one of them could fathom who would even conceive of building a home out there in the deepest, darkest part of the jungle on this distant, unwelcoming moon. Nevertheless, the pirates knew that they had been saved, for there they could take shelter for the night. And moreover, they had found just the thing they had been searching for, a place to hide their treasure. First, however, there remained the question of who already inhabited the strange house, house, for a light was shining in the window, and the scent of fresh cooking made their stomachs growl in hunger. The house was a modest abode built from felled logs with a single window and a single door. Smoke curled from a small stone chimney, suggestive of a welcome fire within. After their treacherous journey through the jungle, the pirates yearned for the warmth and safety it represented. As one, they peered through the lone window to see a woman sitting by the fire in a wooden chair, stirring a large pot of broth on the hearth. She was alone and looked content. After a moment, the woman glanced up, sensing their presence at the window, and at once she hurried to the door to beckon them in. She was a tall, thin woman with a pale face and short black hair, and she was dressed in billowing robes of red and black. She smiled warmly as she urged them into the small house, closing the door behind them. There was not a hint of annoyance at their obvious intrusion on her solitude. 
Gratefully, the pirates hurried in from the cold to huddle near the warmth of the fire. I am Shalish, the woman's tests told them, and you are most welcome in my home. The little house was cozy and the fire cast deep shadows into the corners of the single room, but not deep enough to hide the glittering treasures that covered every wall and every surface. To their amazement, the pirates spotted strange totems cast in shining gold, silver goblets inlaid with precious gems, etched swords in ancient armor, priceless relics from the distant ages, treasures from across the galaxy. The woman had amassed such treasure that what awaited the pirates in the hold of their ship paled in comparison. Tell me, what brings you here? prompted Shellish, for I am not used to visitors and I would understand what has brought you to my doorstep in this strange and lonely place I call home. The pirates spun a tale of terrible woe, claiming they were hunted by fearsome pirates who sought to steal their ship and they had come to the moon to hide, only to find themselves lost in the darkening jungle with nowhere left to turn and no way back to their vessel. Shellish listened patiently, then in turn told of how she had long before been stranded on the moon after she too fled persecution and that in all those long years, the three of them, Marath, Caleb and Juliet, were the first visitors to come upon her home. She promised to shelter them and give them a bowl of warm broth, and she returned to her cauldron by the hearth, stirring and stirring the rich scented contents. Not once did she ask for their help or intimate that they might rescue her by taking her with them aboard their ship. Well, the pirates were untrustworthy sorts, and despite the woman's kindness, they plotted amongst themselves in whispered words and secret code. Just as they had betrayed their former colleagues, so too would they betray Shellish. They resolved to make the most of her hospitality, to enjoy her broth and her shelter, before killing her and taking her treasure for their own, despite the fact that in the hold of their ship they already had more treasure than any of them could ever need. For such is the nature of greed, the affliction that strikes those who seek power and wealth above all else. Shellish's house, they decided, would become their hiding place, and they would store their riches there, away from prying eyes and thieving fingers, and from that day, they would never have to work as pirates again. Seemingly ignorant of their plan, Shellish merrily set about serving up their broth, so happy was she to have company once again after all these years alone. The broth smelled wonderful as she handed it to them in little golden bowls, each one engraved with strange and abstract symbols and which the pirates knew were worth more than the woman could ever conceive. Hungrily, they slurped down the broth, savoring its delicious flavor, so welcome after such a nightmarish journey through the dark jungle, which now they had reached safely. Even the pirates had to admit had been terrifying. They sipped from goblets of rich dark wine and feasted on succulent fruit, which Shellish told them had been scavenged from the nearby forest. All the while, Shellish watched them eat, sipping only water as she sat by the fire in her wooden chair, smiling in pleasure at the pirates wolfing down her food. While Kalab helped himself to seconds, Juliet asked Shellish whether she had any family, inquiring in truth to discover if the woman had any kin who might yet come in search of her for the pirates wished to know that their treasure would be safe there in that strange melancholy house in the jungle. Shella shook her head. I once had sisters, but now they are gone, she told them, although I seek to honor them every day. Juliet smiled, for she knew that a woman alone in the world would never be missed, and neither, therefore, would her treasure. When they had finished their meal and assured Shellish that their appetites were sated, she collected their bowls and carried them to the other end of the room to rinse them clean. While she had her back turned, Juliet gave Marath a signal, and in recognition, he drew his dagger, rising to his feet with evil intent. On his face, he wore a wicked grin, for he knew nothing but the ways of the pirates, and he thought only of the treasure that would be theirs once the terrible deed was done. Yet, Shellish was wise to the pirates' plot, having in truth suspected all along that they harbored murmurous intent, murderous, not murmurous, murderous intentions, and as Marath crept, crept silently toward her, she turned a knowing smile on her crimson lips. There was something in that smile that caused the weak way to halt in his tracks, his knife point wavering. But even as he did, his attention was drawn to the shadows in the far corner, which had, as if agitated by the very darkest of magic, begun to stir to life. In horror, the three pirates watched as the shadows swirled like living things, dancing and conforting 
until they took form, swimming together to reveal the towering form of a shaggy-maned Wookiee. Shellish laughed, a chill laugh that seemed to cut to the pirates' very souls as the Wookiee took a step toward Morath, a low, threatening growl rumbling in its throat. <laughs> its fur was the color of shadows, and its eyes were bright and yellow and menacing. It was half again as tall as Morath, looming over him as it blocked its, his path toward Shellish. It tossed its head back and roared, Rawr! revealing rows of teeth like vicious daggers. Shellish waved a hand, and swirling mists followed in its wake, encircling her in lazy rings, bright and luminous, a sorcerous barrier to defend her against attack. The pirates knew that they stood no chance of overpowering the witch and her Wookiee familiar, and yet as if compelled to see the plan through, or perhaps dazzled by the promise of treasure, Marath threw himself toward Shellish with murder in his eyes. With an ear-splitting roar, the Wookiee intercepted him, knocking him to the ground with a swing of its massive arm, sending the dagger skittering away across the floorboards and Marath sailing after it. He crumpled into a heap, moaning woefully. Shellish laughed again as the Wookiee plucked Marath from where he lay, holding the pro prone Wikwe, the prone Wikwe, aloft like a trophy. Juliet started from her seat, a blaster gripped in her fist, but she already knew it was over. The Wookiee was about to rend them limb from limb, which means tear them limb from limb. Juliet started from her seat, a blaster gripped in her fist, but she already knew it was over. The Wookiee was about to rend them limb from limb. I'm just doing that part again. Now, now, Oachi, said the witch as the Wikwe wailed in Terry. I believe our guests are just leaving. You mean to let us go, said Juliet, in stunned disbelief? You have eaten from my pot and drank from my bottle, and that is everything you deserve. Now you shall leave this place and never return, said Shellish, for next time I shall not be so benevolent. The Wookiee growled, growled in disappointment as he tossed Morath through the open door. The weak way splashed into the swamp water beyond. The others hurried out behind her, behind him, neither of them looking back. The pirates could not believe their luck. Soon they were far from the witch's house, and though none of them could quite shake their misgivings at how easily they'd gotten away, they were jubilant all the same. Dawn was breaking above the treetops, and the path to the plateau soon became clear. The creatures that had slithered unseen in the darkness had sloped back to their watery lairs, and the pirates' journey to the ship remained uncontested. By the, time, by the time they climbed into the vessel, they were even laughing about the look on Morath's face as the Wookiee had pitched him out the door. Soon they joked they would be telling that story in cantinas all across wild space. What I wouldn't give for that witch's treasure, said Kellab, still thinking of the golden bowls and ancient totems, but they all knew that the unspoken truth, that if it weren't for the witch's intervention, the Wookiee would have torn them limb from limb and there would have been nothing they could do to stop it. Any thought of returning to the house had fled their minds. So grateful were they to be safely in their ship. Soon they would be away from the dreadful moon and the horrors it harbored in its jungle, and they would find another world, somewhere more hospitable, where they could hide their ill-gotten treasure. Still, said Juliet, strolling into the hole to take in the heaped treasure with a sweep of her arms, at least we have all this. With a laugh, she grabbed for a golden goblet, holding it up to the others as if to make a toast. With this... Her voice trailed off, her face frozen in horrified shock as the pirates all watched the goblet slowly crumble and turn to dust in her grasp. What? Frantic, wide-eyed, Juliet reached for another, murmuring in abject horror as that too disintegrated in her hands, becoming nothing but streams of dust that trickled through her fingers. The others rushed forward, grabbing handfuls of the treasure, but the effect was the same, and everything from coins to jewels to relics turned to dust. The witch, said Morath. She cursed us. Everything you deserve, said Juliet, tears streaming down her cheeks as more of the te treasure dis disintegrated in her outstretched hands. Wreathed in shadows, Shellish watched from the window of her house as the pirate ship ascended above the treetops, then blasted away into space. A wicked smile drew her lips tight across her face, for all around her, shimmering into being, as if materializing from the dust itself, was the treasure from the pirate's hold, the glittering hoard filling her tiny 
house. She turned to her Wookiee companion and laughed. <laughs> and that, my friends, is the witch and the wolf.